Uh, so in the second half, this is the part where it starts to get a little bit gnarly, I guess. So if you are of a sensitive disposition, then uh, you've been warned. Uh, but let's get stuck in. Uh, so while I outlined earlier when uh, young men from different ethnic groups, why they would end up, sorry, uh, in the profession of becoming eunuchs, they didn't really have much of a choice. Uh, why did so many Han Chinese boys and men choose to enter this profession? Now, there are a wide variety of reasons, but I want to outline here the four main ones. It is estimated that about an eighth of all eunuchs were young children who were forced into the profession by their parents. These families were usually hard on their luck and couldn't support the financial burden of another child. If they already had a son, for example, they didn't need several more sons. On top of that, becoming a eunuch would ensure that their child enjoyed a comfortable and potentially prosperous life within the palace walls. They were also incentivized to give up their children because they would receive a cash reward from the palace for donating their sons. Uh, similarly, many adults who chose to become eunuchs in later life did so because they had no financial means to support themselves and didn't want to resort to a life of begging or stealing. Uh, so mainly it was a financial incentive. The possibility of a life within the palace proved tempting even to those who were not destitute, however. Some men from the peasant class didn't see the point of facing a life filled with hardship and heavy labour, so they made the decision in order to enjoy an easier life within the palace. Now, the final reason was that many emperors offered castration and servitude as an alternative to the death sentence, starting with Emperor Guangwu of the Han Dynasty, who uh, reigned from about 25 to 57 BC. Uh, so now that we know the why, let's get into the gruesome business of the how. And as I said, if you want to go into sort of more about the why, I would really recommend reading some of those articles to go into a bit more depth about individual stories of different eunuchs and how they ended up on the path that they ended up on. Uh, now, different, sorry about this, as I said, euphemistic, but not that much. Uh, different dynasties had different methods for castrating young men, but the process was standardized during the Ming Dynasty. So as I said, during the sort of peak of eunuch culture in China from 1368 to 1644. So that's the method I'm really going to describe here. So first, a boy or man will be taken to a small hut near the Forbidden City called the Changzi, which was solely used for this operation. Within the Changzi was the Dao Zijiang, or the knifer, the knife man, who not only carried out the operation, but who was also responsible for observing the men throughout the process and making sure the healing process was going according to plan. A number of apprentices would work under the knifer while learning his trade because it was incredibly lucrative. Uh, bear in mind, the knifer charged six tails of silver just for the operation, which equates to around $84 or £60 nowadays, and was a huge sum at the time, particularly when you imagine that most of the people doing this were peasants. So it'd be sort of almost all of their savings they're putting into this, thinking that then their child is set for life. Before the operation took place, the patient would be laid down on a bed and have their abdomen or upper and upper thighs tightly bound to prevent hemorrhaging. By the late Qing dynasty, so around about 1644 to 1911, it was documented that the knifer would also use a local anaesthetic that was made from chilli sauce. So as you can imagine, this is a really, really pleasant experience. Uh, the parts that were up for removal, let's put them that way, would then be bathed in hot pepper water three times to disinfect them. Once the operation began, the knifer needed the help of three apprentices. One would hold down the patient's legs to prevent any kind of sudden movement, while the other two would hold his waist and pin down his arms. So no real anaesthetic, just a lot of uh, elbow grease. The knife would then brandish his small cutting knife, which was about 14.5 centimetres long and was profoundly curved. Uh, he would then ask the patient a very key question, ho hui bu ho hui, which means, will you regret this or not? If the man said no or showed any form of doubt, the knife would refuse to go through with the operation. If he consented, however, then the operation would begin. Uh, now both, I'm going to go into some graphic medical detail here, the scrotum and the penis would be removed, preferably with a single slash if the knife was competent enough. With great care, the knife would then insert a pewter needle or spigot into the main orifice at the root of where the penis had been to stop the wound from healing over the urethra um, and to stop the urethra from constricting. The wound would then be dressed with paper soaked in cold water. After the wound had been dressed, it was the apprentice's responsibility to make the new eunuch walk around the room for at least three hours before they were allowed to finally sit or lie down. 
The spigot, of course, prevented the eunuch from being able to urinate, and they had to live like that for three days, meaning they weren't allowed to drink anything and they were consumed by a horrific thirst. You hear this a lot in accounts that they tell afterwards how horrendous these three days were. On the third day, the knifer would remove the spigot and the operation was deemed successful if urine promptly flowed out. If no urine was present, the eunuch was sadly doomed to die a very painful death. But fortunately, only about 2% of all men suffered this fate, surprisingly, when you consider that there was no real kind of uh, care taken, but a lot of care, but no kind of disinfectant or gloves or medical, like a proper medical procedure. Uh, the wound would take about 100 days to heal, after which time the eunuch would assume their new post within the imperial palace. Uh, but what happened to their parts in the end? I'm sure you're all wondering or not. Uh, contrary to what you might believe, the knifer didn't just have a load of sort of boy bits kind of tossed on a pile outside of his hut. Uh, in fact, it was imperative that the eunuch keep his missing parts, which were known as the three preciouses. In Chinese, they're known as the sambal, or sometimes just the bao, which means the three treasures or the just the treasure. They were put into a small container like this one, sealed and placed on a high shelf in the eunuch's living quarters. They had to keep hold of this precious bow for two reasons. The first was that eunuchs needed two things to advance in rank, to pass a strict examination and to, to then, when they passed, present their bow to the head eunuch. For this reason, knifers would sometimes forget to give their patients their bow and then would extort them for huge sums of money when the eunuch invariably came back to claim it, realising that they needed it. Some eunuchs were so desperate that they would even borrow, purchase, or rent a bow in lieu of their own. The second reason was that when a eunuch died, they had to be buried with their bow. Much like the examinations, if a eunuch didn't have one, then they would desperately try to find one before they died. This was because they needed to be as complete as possible physically when they were buried. Otherwise, they may not have their masculinity restored in the afterlife. According to legend, Yen Luo Wang, the king of the underworld, would turn away any eunuch who didn't have their bow and turn them into a female mule instead of a, a person. So not a great fate. After living a life that was already pretty hairy, uh, getting turned into a female mule isn't the greatest fate. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to go into too much depth about what duties eunuchs had at court because there's just so much to cover. So again, I'd really encourage anyone to go read the articles that I've shared. But to finish up with, I want to spare a few moments to talk about the physical changes that eunuchs underwent as a result of the operation. Now, regardless of when the operation happened in their life, this type of full castration cut off the supply of testosterone to their body, which affected, of course, first of all, the person's voice. If the operation was done before they had gone through puberty, their voices would never break and would sometimes even get higher as a result. If they had the operation as adults, however, then their voices would become higher in pitch, but also slightly cracked, as if they were going through puberty again. As you can imagine, the operation left them with considerably, considerably sorry, weak bladder control, so they would often wet their beds and even their clothes. This led to the old Chinese saying, as stinky as a eunuch. In later years, they were also considered too weak to perform strenuous physical activities. Those who had the operation before puberty would also be considerably flabbier and softer than men of the same age, so kind of puppy fattish, uh, but would eventually lose this puppy fat as they got older. Although beard growth would stop entirely, they otherwise aged rather rapidly, which meant they would often look much older uh, than their years, particularly when they got into their later years, they would suddenly go from looking very, very young to looking extremely old. They were prone to bouts of extreme emotions, as you can imagine, after going through something like this, including in particular moments of uncontrollable rage. Uh, due to the understandable discomfort in their lower regions, they would take very small steps, keep their to toes pointed outwards rather than forwards, and lean slightly forward when they walked. Uh, in fact, it was actually said that you could easily recognise a palace eunuch just from their unusual gait, so from them walking towards you. Uh, and with that all out of the way, Thank you very much, everyone, for uh, for joining us today. I hope you all enjoyed it. And I hope that last part wasn't too bad. Uh, as I said, I will send out the pack later, which contains some interesting articles related to Unix. Uh, and now if you want to turn off the recording now, uh, you can.